So again, welcome everybody. Uh, if you find an outline in your worship folder, and you can follow along as we are finishing a little short series that I am calling Transform for What? And it all began with a quote that gave me my job description, right? Pastoral leadership is energizing a community of church people, that would be you all, toward their own transformation in order to accomplish a shared mission in the face of a fast-changing culture. That's the best job description I've ever seen in my life. So we spent seven Sundays talking about personal transformation. And then I said, okay, well, what are we transformed? Well, here it is, in order to accomplish a shared mission. And, uh, well, what is that mission? And where do we find it? Well, we find it from Jesus. Jesus called his followers to join him in his mission, and he was very clear about his mission. We did a whole sermon on the mission of Jesus. The shortest version of that is in Luke 19.10, where Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. So if you look at your chart, you'll see on the far left side is find the irreligious. That's our term for the lost, the spiritually destitute, the, uh, those who are bankrupt spiritually or far from God. Jesus called them the lost. We call them the irreligious. And that's where Jesus is about. He is about finding lost people. Lost people matter to God and to Christ. After his resurrection and right before his ascension, Jesus gathered his disciples who would then gather in house churches groups of people, Acts 2, 42 and following, and he gave them this command as a body of followers. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to obey, hmm, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And this is the mission of the church. He says, you disciples, go make more disciples. Again, a disciple is a follower, a learner. So there's lots of teaching, lots of education going on. And an apprentice. So you learn by doing as well. And that's the second block in the chart. You've got the find block, and then you've got the equip and mend chart. This is where we're making disciples as a church organization. Um, so in this message, I want to go to the next block. It's called the salt, light, and love block. You see it there? We're going to be sent. We have a personal mission. If you are a disciple or a follower of Jesus, he didn't just give the church a mission. He gave each of us as individual followers a mission, and that's what this message will be about today. Now, my first full-time position on a church staff was as a youth director in a Presbyterian church. Can you spell Presbyterian? I can. It took me a while to learn that. But I had uh, some grandkids in my youth group that was uh, the grandkids of an elder in the Presbyterian church. He was probably in his 80s, but his name was Harvey. And Harvey and I had great conversations and one thing that I'll never forget him telling me is he says, there are some in our church who think all God or Jesus expects of them is an hour a week and a dollar. <laughs> yep, that's what he said. And I just, really? Yeah, that's all Jesus really wants from me is an hour a week and a dollar to sit and soak in a pew and, uh, and listen to a sermon, say a prayer, sing a three hymns. And, and when the plate comes by or the bag, you know, you put a buck in it and, you, man, you go home and say, man, I did it. I did what God wanted me to do. You know, an hour a week and a dollar. You know, I'm just going, man, that doesn't do it for me. I don't know about you because we were built innately for significance. We want to feel like we are going to make a difference, that our life has meaning and purpose. And I don't know about you, but an hour a week and a dollar just doesn't make that. <laughs> That's a very low bar, right? A very low sense of expectation. Uh, that gives me no real significance and purpose, you know. We want to make an impact. We want to leave a legacy. We were built to do that. And so in the text this morning, Jesus solves the mystery 
of why he put you on this earth and why he came to call disciples. Jesus resolves the tension that we all have is, does life matter? And can I make any kind of difference in the world? I'm here to tell you today that Jesus does have clear and lofty standards and expectations for you, and they far exceed an hour a week and a dollar. So if that's been you, I'm going to pinch you just a little bit today. Actually, Jesus is. So let's look at the text that he gave. It's in his first recorded teaching in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 5 through 7. I know the women have been studying this on Thursday night, and I know they've talked about this text, and I haven't read your notes, so you can check me out to see if I'm on target here. But join me in reading Matthew 5, 13 through 16, where Jesus said, ready? You are the salt of the earth, but if the salty loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So you see anything there that says an hour, a week, and a dollar? Not in your Bible, is it? No, this is your job description as a personal disciple of Jesus. You are to be salt and light. And I want to talk about those two metaphors today, and then I've added a third one, which is love. So Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the earth. In this teaching session, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is on a hillside. There is a crowd of people, but here in the grammatical text, you is emphatic. And so he is addressing his disciples, those first 12. And he is saying, you gentlemen are the one and only people I'm expecting as my first followers, to go out and be salt and light of the earth. It's emphatic. He's talking to those 12 disciples. And we today, if we follow in that, he's talking to us. Now, salt is a very common commodity. I have salt to give away today. I got a lot of it here. And if you want one, you may take one home after the service. But it's a valuable mineral, is it not? Um, every living plant, every living animal, people, human, you got to have salt. You got to have salt, uh, but in moderation, of course, right? Too much salt, bad for your heart. I know that. Um, I learned in my study that salary, the word salary is Latin for salt. I didn't know that. You ever heard somebody say, uh, or, is that guy worth his salt? You know, they're saying, does he work hard? That's the phrase. And apparently, In Jesus' day, the Roman soldiers, as part of their pay, got salt because it was that valuable in that day, and it is valuable in our day as well. So basically, Jesus is saying, uh, you are valuable to me, and I want you to add value to the world that you are in. Salt is also beneficial. I looked online, the benefits of salt, man, 15 just personal physical benefits. And I got a sample of some Dead Sea bath salts. And I'll give these away too afterwards. You put your feet in them or you can put your whole bath in them and just soak in these wonderful salts here. I mean, it's good for the skin. It's good for your digestion. You know, Dan, you need to gargle with hot salt water, right? That's the advice, right? It's going to help so very, very much. Um, so it's, it's good for us. Um, I know how beneficial it is because in 2006, I'll never forget it, I was in the hospital for five days. Never since then, nor before then, was I ever hospitalized for dehydration. I got an intestinal bug, you don't want to get it, and I was, I was near dead, they told me. And so what did the doctor do? You need IV fluids. And there's that little bag, you know, and, and I'm getting things in me, you know, and he said, that's not just water, H2O. That's salt and minerals because your body 
to, he, to rehydrate, you've got to have those fluids, those minerals in your body. So I know salt is very important, even in the desert. Salt is influential, right? We know it preserves, it prevents decay on meat, salt, pork, and so forth, right? How can we be a preserving influence as a disciple in our culture? Well, we can uh, practice and uphold what we call traditional Christian values. That doesn't just mean praying and reading the Bible and coming to church. It, it means, you know, having respect for family. It means uh, being a hard worker at your job. It's, it's being an, an honest person. It's having a clear sense of what's right and what's wrong. It's having integrity in your leadership and respect for authority. Amen? The, these are traditional values. Uh, moderation rather than excess, and upholding marriage as, as something beautiful and sacred, uh, taking care of our own family and our elders, you know, honoring your mother and father. These are not only biblical values, but these are traditional Christian values. Add that to, again, the list in Galatians 5, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We can be a preserving influence when we're those kinds of people. Uh, salt also enhances the flavor of food. Again, not too much. So last uh, Friday, I was uh, at my son's house. His birthday was on Saturday, 40 years old he was, my gosh. And uh, so I was helping him get the yard ready, but his wife was inside and her mother was there. And they, I walked in there to say hi, and they had this bowl of coleslaw like this. And we're talking together, and all of a sudden, the mother-in-law is tasting it. She grabs a salt shaker and just goes, like that. We're going, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, it needs more flavor, she said. And and she salted the heck out of it. Um, But salt adds flavor. So, again, moving from coleslaw, let's look at Jesus. This is my favorite picture of Jesus. If, you know idolatry and all of that aside, you know, if I'm going to think of Jesus as, as a face, this is, this is my favorite picture of Jesus. I, I love that because what do I see there? I see robust health, what somebody said, vim, vigor, and vitality, right? I see confidence. I see courage. I see everything good and positive. And, 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 and that speaks to me that that's the way we are to be in relationship or when we're in a task or a situation, we can be a positive flavoring influence by not only our words, but our behavior, our attitude. Uh, And that's what Jesus is calling us to. Paul said in Colossians 4, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned as it were with salt. You know, so our words can be a flavorful can bring out the best in any circumstances. And this is what Jesus is calling us to be and do. Of course, it has medicinal purposes as well. It promotes the healings of wounds, of course, oral rinses and all though, uh, and our skin. And we can be salt in a medicinal sense in our society by, by unleashing our own compassion, you know, responding to human need, by working for peace, by Uh, working towards reconciliation by offering forgiveness in relationships. Uh, This is a healing ministry that we can have as salt. Now, the key issue of salt is proximity, right? You are the salt of the earth. He didn't say you are the salt of the church. He didn't say you are the salt of heaven. He said, you, my disciples, are the salt of the earth, and the earth is the inhabited land we live on, not heaven, in contrast to heaven, the sphere where moral evil prevails. Where is salt needed? On earth. And to be effective, as you well know, salt in a salt shaker needs to get on the food, right? It needs to get in contact with your skin, right? This does no good in the bag, right here. Anybody benefiting from this salt right now? Not anybody. Until you put it in the bathtub and get in it, it's not going to do anybody any good whatsoever. So let's imagine this worship center is a salt shaker, and you are all grains of salt. Here we are. Wonderful. We're getting salty here. Are we any good? No, we're not. 
We need to be salty where? Outside of this place. So tell me this, folks. Why are we on our best behavior at church? <laughs> you know, I, I'm one of the guys that try to keep it secret that I'm a pastor, especially if I'm golfing. I don't golf anymore. Because as soon as you're out there with these guys and we're golfing and the language is certain color, you know, and as soon as they find out, oh, what do you do? And I said, I'm a pastor of a church. Zoom. Oh, boy. You know, it cleans up the conversation instantly, you know. And weddings, you know, they're waiting for the pastor to leave because then the party really gets started, right? <laughs> I know it. I know it. <laughs> what, what is that about? We are to be on our best behavior where? Not here, out there. Yeah, I want you to behave here, of course. But the point is, we want to be out of the salt shaker and into our world. The last time I checked, we're not an Amish church, are we? I don't see anybody dressed like that. Anybody bring their, their, their horse and buggy to church today? You know, I don't, uh, not, not to say anything bad about Amish, but they, they believe in separation from the world. They don't want contact with the world. How do they get past this verse? How do they get past John 15, uh, 19 and John 17, 14, where Jesus tells his disciples, I want you in the world, proximity, but not of the world. Big difference there. That's always a challenge. In, but not of. Jesus was criticized constantly by hanging out with the wrong people, wasn't he? You're eating with sinners. He was called a friend of sinners, and they thought that was the worst thing they could do. You know, these non-practicing Jews, these tax collectors and prostitutes and stuff like that. And for Jesus, it was the highest compliment to be called a friend of sinners. He says, you know, I came to seek and to save the, the lost, those far from God. I'm like a doctor who was trained to treat the sick, not the well. So... You know, that's how he said it. You know, so in our fast changing culture, what did I read? That our culture changes in, the, in, in every 18 months, or is it even less than that? And it's just going faster and faster. Even the media can't keep up. But public speech and behavior is scrutinized more and more. Would you agree with that? Who have to be careful what you say, right? Because people are watching, and they always got their phones on, right? So what happened this last week? The CEO and the CFO of Disney had got in the newspaper because they violated company policy, and so they had to quit, right? The CFO, right? Oh, what did I say? Okay. Yeah, I'll correct that. See? It happens. McDonald's, the CFO and the CEO both resigned. And then in the paper, I was just reading it. You know, this history teacher, I think he was in Oakland, Wanted to make some illustration in his classroom, you know, dressed up as a popular rap star, but he put black on his face. And man, just social media just said, man, you need to resign. So the world is watching behavior and words, and all of a sudden, you're out. You're out of the running. Your job is over if the behavior doesn't fit the culture these days. So as I said, Jesus' followers ought to be on their best behavior where? Not just here, but out there in our community where everyone is watching. And believe me, people are watching. So what are some examples of some influential or salty Christians? Just go online, go type in top 50 influential Christians and you'll have names like Chip and Joanna Gaines, professing Christians on TV. Of course, the Pope is on there. Then, of course, there's music and athletes, you know, Carrie Underwood, Simone Biles, Tim Tebow, Stephen Curry are all professing Christians who, on occasion, the microphone and the cameras are rolling and they can say something positive about their faith. And as far as I know, their reputations are solid as professing Christian people. So they are in a position of influence and they are using that influence well, it appears, at this time. Um, so that's all about salt. Out of the salt shaker, into the world. That's what Jesus is calling his disciples. Second, light of the world. Um, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, comparison, let your light shine before others, not just other believers, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So light is to be visible. City on a hill. In those days, cities were made out of light-colored limestone. Could be seen in a full moon, uh, very bright. On a hill, you know, usually for defense purposes. You can see who's coming at you, but you can't miss it. There it is. And candles or oil lamps that was used in those days were put on a lampstand in the middle of the room or somewhere where it gives light to all the house. You don't, you don't snuff it. You don't put a bowl over it unless, you know, you're going to sleep or, you know, somebody's attacking you. Light provides guidance. If you ever landed on an airport at night, you're very thankful that there are lights on the runway. A light provides hope in darkness. In fact, did you know that the definition of darkness is the absence of light? That's dictionary definition of darkness, is the absence of light. And where there's light, there's hope. You ever been camping? Here's your campfire, and you walk away from the campfire out into the woods. Scary thing. It's dark. But as soon as you turn around, ah, there's the light. I know where to go. There's, there's home. There's, there's the place I need to be. So light gives hope. And Israel, the prophet Isaiah said, was to be a light to the nations. And then in John 8, Jesus comes along. He is at the festival of tabernacles. That's where they, they live in these little tents uh, during the week uh, to uh, pattern their lives after the wilderness travels. But in the temple, in the court, there were, uh, let me see if this is right, two lofty stands, each supporting four great lamps. So maybe they were menorahs, you know, seven candles each, four times seven, that's a lot of light. And it is in that context that Jesus stood there and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so Jesus said he is the light, and then he said to his followers, you are the light of the world. We are to be emanations of his light and life. We're out in the world. That is the world of people. So the key issue here in this, in this metaphor is, is public good works. In the same way that a city is visible on a hill, in the same way... That, uh, that a light is left in a dark house. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. So your good deeds need to be visible. They need to be out. And so they would glorify your Father in heaven. Now what's confusing is just a few verses later in the same sermon, Jesus says to the same disciples... Be careful not to practice your righteousness, which I assume would mean good deeds, in front of others to be seen by them. If you do that, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. That seems like a contradiction. At one point, he's saying, be visible with your good deeds, but then be careful. But again, it's the motive. If you're doing good deeds just to be seen by others, to get your picture on TV, to have somebody interview you and say, look at you, pat you on the back. What a good person you are. Look what you did. Jesus is basically saying, I'm not interested in theatrics here. If you do it to be seen by others, then guess what? That's the only award you're going to get. Public acknowledgement for being a good person. But God is supposed to get the praise, not you. And our culture is full of that, right? I can guarantee you this Thanksgiving, you're going to see politicians on TV serving at the food, soup kitchens. They'll do it every time. That's theatrics, right? That's theatrics. I'm doing it to be seen by others. For Jesus' followers, no, we don't serve to be seen by others. We serve so that God will be praised. So here's my problem with church. Churches go out and and find these service projects, right? And then they get these shirts, all the same color, with the name of the church on it. 
they call the media and say, our church is going to be over here doing this good thing for the community. And so we get our picture in the paper and we get a few little words of applause. I think Jesus is, he wouldn't wear that shirt. (laughs) Folks, don't ask me to buy shirts for you because I'm not doing it. I'm just not. I just don't feel good about that. Our deeds need to stand for themselves and they need to give God the glory. We, we don't need to do it. And it's so tempting, isn't it? Yeah, let's get the shirts. Let's call the media. We want to build the PR of our local congregation. Yeah, it, it goes in the face of this. It really does. So what about people being light? How about Kanye West? I don't listen to his music. I just know he's a popular name, right? But Kanye is a professing believer And in February, he released an album of gospel songs that he entitled, Jesus is King. Now, man, I'm all over that because I believe Jesus is the king of the world. And what courage to do that. Angela Forker, on the news just last week, she said in the interview that God gave her the idea to photograph, to stage special needs babies with this special art. It was incredible, her story. But she said, God gave me the idea. This is the way she's being a light to the world with her art. Then this fall, the movie Mr. Rogers is coming, right? Mr. Rogers. Fred Rogers, now deceased, was a Presbyterian minister, ordained. But did he find his ministry in the church? No. He found his ministry with children and on television. Everybody saw Mr. Rogers, right? Would you doubt that he's being a light in the way that he was? It's a tremendous thing. And so there's all different ways that you and I can be lights in our world. Just listen to the voice and follow it as God leads you to be light again. Not here, but out there. Then thirdly, just got a couple minutes. We got to talk about love, right? Salt, light, and love. Not in this passage, but in later in Matthew, Jesus says there's two great commandments. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So love, we know, is the greatest virtue because God is love. He isn't just loving. He is in his being love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. God is love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, Paul said what? Three things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. It is the greatest virtue, and it is the highest expectation of Jesus' followers. John 13, 34. By this, everyone, okay, everyone will know that you are my disciples. What is that? that everyone will see, if you love one another. That's bottom line. If we aren't loving, the world is going to go, see you later. It is the most powerful force. Solomon said in Song of Psalms, love is stronger than death. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. Love is eternal, and it will never, never go away. The key issue with love is it must have an object. Did you know that God created you to love you? How about that? How could God be loving if he didn't create someone to love? And now that he has created us, we can love him back. And we can love one another. We can love our neighbors. We can love, Jesus says, even your enemies. Love must have an object. And so look on your chart again, if you would. This is the last time you'll see this chart. Look on the chart. See where we've been talking about. And this is how you can love your oikos. That is your world, right? Your 8 to 15 people who already know you. You already know them. We're not asking you to go out, you know, on the street corner with a sign or anything like that. We're just saying... Here's where to be salt and light and love to this group of people who already know you. And how can you be salt, light, and love to them? You can start praying for them. You know, you believe prayer works? Yes. Pray for them. Pray for their souls. Find a way to serve them. Anything. 
Just be a Boy Scout. Look for things you can do. Uh, or a Girl Scout. Serve. Be prepared to defend your faith. Answer their questions. You know, Share the bridge illustration. Can you do that? Can you take a piece of paper and say, you know, God loves you and wants a relationship with you, but your sin separated you, but Christ died for you to be the bridge, and you need to make a choice, or you can make a choice? Can you share that simple diagram to somebody if the occasion arose? Uh, again, live your faith in front of them, and at some point, invite them to church. You know, you go take them all the way back to the beginning. You're, you're, you're fulfilling Jesus' mission when you do that. So salt, light, and love. It's easy to remember. That's what I am here on this earth. To be salt, light, and love. And I want you to never forget that Jesus didn't say, just do that. I'm going to watch you struggle. Be salt, be light, be love. But he promised you the power to do it. Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. You will be my salt, my light, my love, even to the ends of the earth. Jesus gave these commands. He left this earth. He entrusted them with his missions. And guess what? They did it. They did it. You wouldn't be here today if they hadn't done the job. Why is there 2.5 billion professing disciples of Jesus in the, in the world today is because people like you and I are continuing to be salt, light, and love. We are continuing to go out and make disciples of the nations. This is the mission of Jesus. This is your mission if you choose to accept it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, that these are very simple but very powerful metaphors that you have called us to live out. You came with a mission. You gave your church, the organized body of believers, a mission. And you gave each of us as individual followers a mission. And I have spoken that today, to be salt, light, and love. But if there's someone here today who has not the power of the Holy Spirit within them, then it is a fruitless thing to try to attempt to be those things. But today, will you confess your sins? Will you invite Jesus to forgive you of your sins and and invite him to fill you with his spirit and his power so that you can begin a life of significance because life is so much more than an hour a week and a dollar in church. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.